There we go. Hello, everyone. I am Todd Bookspan on behalf of Dave Savage and everyone at Mortgage Coach. Welcome to episode 204 of our Friday Mastermind, which I am labeling Kicking Ass with John Downs. And I'm super excited to welcome none other than John Downs. Hey, thanks so much. It's, it's always great to come on. I, I, I didn't realize it's been probably like a year and a half or so. So I, I'm real excited to be back. You know, it's always fun to have John on here. And he was just joking beforehand that he has no idea what we're going to talk about. But that's actually really what the key is with John is to get him going. I think what you're going to find with John, and I'll sort of go back. I've known John for, I guess, maybe seven, eight years now. Is that about right? Yeah, 2012, 13. Yeah, so we've known each other for, for quite a while. And, and what I respect most about John, well, he's just a good guy. But when it comes to business, he is a systems guy. He's super great at executing if you've watched any of his videos, he's great at marketing. And really what struck me is if you would have seen any of his recent videos, he recently switched companies, which is kind of a crazy thing to do in this environment that we're in. Most people are staying put where they're at because if, if you're going to move, it's, you're going to lose 90 days. And John did this post, which was pretty amazing. So let's talk about your, your first day or your first month when you made a transition. Uh, you know, I thought maybe most people put up a goose egg. How did you do? Yeah, so I, you know, it's a little bit of a blur, right? And, and I, I think there's certainly the market. So Mr. Market played a big role in really all of our successes this year. A friend of mine, Steve Grossman from NJ Lenders, was telling me the other day, he's like, we're all like this 110 pound skinny kids going into a bar with our beer muscles being the toughest guy in the room. Uh, but it, it's, uh, but it was a great first month. It was 82 loans, I think, 40 some million in originations and. The month after, uh, you know, 60-ish loans for about 32 and a half million closed. So it was pretty much just jump right in and make stuff happen and try to keep a high level of service and keep your focus. So it was, it was actually fun. It, it was uh, a, lot, a lot of energy to get, to get all that through, but it, uh, it definitely fed me and gave me even more. So it was a lot of fun. All right. So for, for people who don't know, what market are you in? So I'm in the DC metro area. Yep, there we go. So you you're doing you do a wide range of loans, but a lot of a lot of high balance, a lot of jumbo stuff. You know, so of course in today's world, not a lot of jumbo, but uh, but yeah. So uh, what makes DC very interesting is you have probably 10% government, so mostly VA. There are not a ton FHA in my world, um, and then predominantly, I mean, I will say when you see people in these big markets do a lot of a lot of business, it is absolutely not because they're a genius. It is because the consumer is really sharp. And generally, if you're in a market where a lot of the digital, whether it's verifications of employment or the asset checks or a lot of the appraisal waivers that you get, right? So maybe the brain part of it is utilizing all those things, setting loans up properly so that they can kind of go into underwriting with like a one touch and done philosophy. Uh, but the consumer is actually pretty simple. The loans are not that hard. When you get out a little bit into the suburbs, um, they can get a little bit more hair on them. But, you know, I, I will say the local market makes us a little better than, than maybe what we, <laughs> than what we look like. Yeah. You definitely are spoiled with uh, high quality borrowers, but you said systems. I mean, you're getting stuff through the system. You've got kind of walked through a lot of people I think are struggling right now with setting expectations. And so how are you getting your borrower set up for what the process is going to be like? That's a good question. So, I do have a different philosophy, I think, when it comes to lending. You know, a lot of people, when they think systems, you think of a relay re race with a lot of baton passes, right? So salesperson is like, I'm on the phone, I'm locking people, and I'm converting. And then it might go over to this person that cleans up the application. And then a processor that's chasing all this stuff. An underwriter that gives you, like, that many conditions. And then someone putting duct tape all, all over it and then trying to jam it in at the end. So I think there's several things to closing lots of loans in markets like this but I really put all the energy and emphasis on the loan officer, the, the one that's actually taking the application. And when I said sort of going in and out of underwriting with like a one and done philosophy, when we made the transition, I have one junior loan officer, Josh Brower, and then an app to close slash processor, her name's Vicki. And it was just the three of us that did all that business. But then Josh and I sat down and we said, okay, we can't wait for the payoff to know what the payoff is. So before the loan even goes into the system, we get a bank, uh, uh, the, at the mortgage statement, and you just figure out what the payoff is, right? Principal balance, how many more uh, payments are they going to make? Maybe take off two months of principal, add one month of interest, that's your payoff. 
get your escrows dialed in. If we're closing that month, in our market, I use a pay plus two the month it's due philosophy, and then I back out how many payments they make. So if I'm settling in DC and we're funding in the month of October, my first payment's December, December, January, February, March, we're gonna make five payments. I need eight months in March, so I'm gonna escrow three, right? So we figure all that out so that our loan amount is perfect. So we do that for hazard, we do that for taxes, we do that for the payoff. And then you start thinking of uh, how can you have the fewest amount of papers in the file for an underwriter to look at, right? So if you have borrower, co-borrower, maybe you just underwrite the, the borrower's income, remove co-borrower if you don't need the extra income. Um, another thing we did is we, we had everybody basically um, come to the table and get like $1,000 back. So we didn't really structure a lot of things to say, um, you know, you're going to bring a payment or whatever, because then that leads into assets that could lead into just more paperwork and more annoyances. So um, to your point of the client expectation, I think that was your original question. The, uh, the idea is to just explain that I think I, what we heard somewhere there was $11 trillion of mortgages that were eligible for refinance. The industry is only built to do one and a half trillion a year at full capacity. And now everybody's working from home and homeschooling their kids and lenders can't staff up the way they would in past markets because it's hard to train people remotely. So everyone's just trying to figure out what they're doing. But if you act fast, you can get ahead of the wave and not have any problems. So that was sort of the script that I used to explain why I need you to work really hard for the next 18 hours. And then we're just going to coast all the way to closing. Uh, and it, that worked pretty well. Well, that's awesome. And you weren't afraid to do a little extra work up front itself, your sounds like, where oftentimes you just said people want to push it in off on the rest of the team. Yeah. So that's probably the different, you know, when I talk to some friends around the country and they hear, like, so I disclosed all my own loans. Um, as things started, you know, I think you told me this once, right? Like you're drinking something through a straw and there's like a rock stuck in going all the way up. Like that sometimes when you're, when you're bringing in, 40, 50, 60 loans into a system, it's just like, you know, that snake's got to digest that cow as it goes through. And the easiest way to do it is to sh like share all the work. So in my mind, we had to check our egos and say, you know, I normally don't disclose all my loans, but I'm going to disclose all my loans. I normally don't push everything into underwriting, but I'm going to push everything into underwriting, right? So we, we kept on my team load balancing appropriately doing everybody else's job to just keep things moving faster. Um, and again, the, the power of putting a bulletproof 1003 together, taking 15 more minutes on the phone with someone just saves you an immense amount of time later on in the process. I love that. I, I should throw it up there too. I didn't, I didn't mention up front. So John's gonna be one of the speakers. I think you guys have probably seen it by now that, uh, that Dave and I launched the modern mortgage summit, you can uh, check it out. We'll put a link down below. John will be one of our 30 plus speakers who's done, most of who have already done over $100 million this year. It's a one day live event. Uh, Dave and I are going to be live in Atlanta, uh, running it virtually from there and everyone will be a virtual event. We actually have, um, thanks to some great lender partners who've already jumped in with their sales teams, we've already got over 5,000 people signed up wow. uh, for awesome. the event. We'd love to have you guys be part of it. Uh, just check out the link that we're posting in here. It's modern mortgagesummit.com, although someone said they were having troubles with link earlier. So we're just going to put the direct link to the actual technology we're using. It's actually called Leader Pass. If any of you guys know who John Maxwell is, um, it's actually what was designed for John Maxwell's uh, Live to Lead program that he did. They actually created this technology and we're uh, using their technology to uh, launch this event. So Dave and I are super excited about it. It's a hundred bucks. And if you really want a day where you're going to have 30 plus short lessons from the best teachers in the industry, as well as about a half a dozen keynotes, um, it's going to be action packed, super fast. Uh, I don't even know what you're talking about, John. Have you thought about it yet? Or we don't want to spoil that for the group. <laughs> you know, maybe you guys could give me some ideas. <laughs> no, <it's all> right. <laughs> You know, what's funny is that, so you mentioned uh, transition, right? And how crazy transition is. I would say mortgage coach became, you know, if you, if you think of moving, well, what goes into moving new systems, new people, a new way of doing business, a new philosophy, a new ideology, right? Like all this stuff is new. And mortgage coach was like the grounding force of being able to kind of come in, you know, I had a new enterprise edition. Our company's on an enterprise edition. Prior company was on an enterprise edition. So I just had to tweak my templates and my strategy templates. And 
get back to the old way of doing business effortlessly and fast. So that was, that was actually really fun. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, think, I think I might just show people how I um, build my presentation through telling stories and then even how maybe I frame it in the email to send to people. Because I think if you sort of figure out the holistic approach of using Mortgage Coach effectively, one is the presentation, two is the email, three would be the video, and let's say four would be the screen share and, and changing things. Um, so I, I think somewhere in there, I'll think of something to, to kind of- All right, that with. sounds perfect. Um, you can also look, there's uh, towards the bottom below mine and Dave's pictures, there's a list of a lot of the topics that the teachers have already picked and the keynotes are in there and it's, it's gonna be great. I also forgot to mention, Rene Rodriguez is gonna be the MC, which is just gonna be uh, huge. We brought him in and we just know he'll do such a great job of taking what everyone's teaching and then reframing it so that you all can use it. Uh, it's just gonna be a blast. We're, we're so excited for it. And you know, we, uh, Dave and I have teamed up to do some stuff like the site visit we did earlier this year with Jeremy Forcier. We obviously teamed up to start the Productivity Mastermind Group. And I think this is the next evolution, which uh, should be a blast. How about you mentioned mortgage coach. So obviously if Dave was here, he would go back and dig in a little bit on uh, you know, what you're saying. So you're obviously using strategy templates, you said. So you, you're using a lot of the stuff that I, when I talk to other loan officers, they forget to set up in their mortgage coach. They just each time come in and start from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still probably 70% that person because, uh, you know, it's funny. The, the, if there's a, a break in my system, it is the ability to take my conversation, my client conversation, and then take that to a junior partner to then have that partner create the presentation because half the time when I create my presentation, I move it all around. Like sometimes it's, it's seeing the numbers play out in all the charts makes me say, well, that's a stupid option. <laughs> you know, let me, let me change that one and take that out. Whereas going in, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to show this and this and this. Um, so the strategy templates are just, you know, let's say I have someone in DC and, what I find is that I'm constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again, right? Like a common thing would be first time home buyer, 5% down condos ranging from 450 to 600. Well, I should just have a strategy template put together that all those price points are there. And the only thing I have to do is go in and change condo fee and rate. And then the whole thing is done. And then take that a step further. You're on a phone call with someone and they're telling you all these things and you're like, Hey, are you in front of your computer? Awesome. Strategy template, copy name, send link. All right. Check your inbox. I'm going to tweak some rates and things like that. And then boom, you're having a live presentation right there. So I think that's the power of the strategy template is it's to build instant scale either in the presentation creation or um, to accelerate your ability to while you're on the phone, first phone call to put something in the inbox to tweak very fast and have a more deeper, meaningful conversation. I love it too. Plus Robert, our behind the scenes, he's like the wizard of Oz here this morning or every morning on Fridays. Um, and he's actually put a link to how to do that with uh, mortgage coach. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's so interesting because that's, like I said, on, on the, you know, outside of this call is that you're so good at implementing things. You, you come up with an idea and you make it happen. And you're also willing to move on. You might invest a lot of time into it. And if it, if it wasn't what you thought it would be, you're okay pushing it aside. You're not going to keep doing CPR on something that's not working. Yeah, true. You know, some others would say that maybe I, I get 70% on a lot of ideas and I don't like crush through the final 30. <laughs> so the, uh, you know, the things that I've, I've learned from you is, um, you know, you, you only have to do a couple things really, really, really well and just be really consistent at those things. You know, I, I definitely have been, uh, my mind's been polluted with shiny objects, um, always different ways of doing things. Um, whereas, you know, as, actually as I transitioned, it was, okay, I'm just going to focus on me, my team, do business. I'm going to do these principles. And when I, you're not distracted and you're sticking to principles, you do a lot of business. Right? Sometimes it's the distractions of trying to do more and try more that can actually slow you down. So, but yes, I, I think I, I love trying new things uh, sometimes to uh, my detriment. Well, I think that's a really good point, right? It's, it's the whole idea of why uh, horses and horse races wear blinders, right? To keep them from doing those other things. Other people may call it pruning, right? You got to eliminate those things, especially at a time like now where you kind of said it, it's loans are, loans are happening. They're still such a great opportunity. And I, I'm tending to find that 
people are still focused on how do I get online leads? How do I do these other things versus actually just picking up the phone and calling their past database and, you know, for the third time, because they didn't reach them the second time and making sure that they get a hold of them to get that, that one last refinance. Um, you're also doing a considerable amount of purchase business though in there too, right? You're just, mm -hmm. those numbers weren't just all refis. Yeah. So I actually, before the call looked it up, trying to just figure out like, where am I? And it's probably about 35, 40% purchase. There's still a healthy amount uh, with those numbers. I mean, the, the purchase market's bananas. Uh, you know, I think every, almost every area in my local market is multiple offers and, you know, everyone's looking for an edge of how to win. Uh, actually a pretty good idea. Maybe I can share this one. I don't know if people are using mortgage coach for this, but in our market, waiving the appraisal contingency is probably one of the bigger ways to win. And it's always been a little tricky trying to explain it. Like, well, if you waive your appraisal contingency, everyone always thinks, well, you just have to come up with cash. And the reality is you don't, right? You, you, your loan is based on loan to value. So if you're putting 20% down and you're in, let's say, a market where you can do a 95% conventional, and essentially, the house can appraise for 15% less, and the only difference is PMI. So we would actually create these contract proposals that would show, you know, here is a $600,000 price. You want to put 20% down. That's what that looks like. But if the house appraises at 570, your loan looks like this. At 530, it looks like this, right? You can kind of step down. And then through the chart, the savings over X months, you make that um, equal to when the PMI drops off and it will show you the true cost of waiving that appraisal contingency. So that has actually been a big positive for me in my market because a lot of people just have the fear of waiving the appraisal, even though you look at the numbers and the data and everyone's like, yeah, it's going to be kind of like right in there. It looks pretty good. But the fear of it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's going to cost me thousands of dollars. And then when you run the mortgage coach and you're like, oh, if it appraises 5% less, it's going to cost you $1,800 in PMI. Big deal. <laughs> uh, so that that's huge. actually, that is huge. I mean, like, that's a great takeaway. Maybe I don't want to put, uh, give you a to do, but if you have one that's easy to get to post in the group later, that would be, mm -hmm. that would be awesome. For sure. I think it's, I mean, those are the kinds of ideas, John, that always, that always amaze me. Um, as far as other tips and tricks from the loan process that you think are worth talking about, cause I, I'm going to get us to the video and the other stuff that I love that you do. But, uh, you know, as far as, um, any other piece when it comes to your team from a productivity perspective, obviously you said you're using mortgage coach on the front end as the point of sale, any other pieces that you can think of that are, that you changed that have helped you guys get that volume through? So, you know, you, you can't really under, I, I don't want to make this like a company thing. Right. But um, I mean, at some point your company has a lot to do with it their systems that they employ. It's their way of manufacturing a loan. So I, I think there's a big piece of that that's like kudos to company. Um, the other part was just truly, I, I said this for 18 years, the, the guy that trained me, the guy named Steve Lagana, CEO of First Home Mortgage actually here in my, my market, awesome guy. And he just kept telling us over and over again. And Chris Washburn, another guy, uh, uh, you, you, you gotta take perfect 10 or threes, perfect 10 or threes, perfect 10 or threes. And everyone would leave the meeting room and be like, what is he talking about, about a perfect 1003? But really, if you just ask all the questions to fill in all the blanks on the 1003, and then anything you hear that's a little off, you ask more questions to get more clarity. As you start the process, things are already done. Like, like that's the dog. Abby is saying hello to everybody. Morning, Abby. I can hear that. Um, the... Uh, but the, so anyway, so that's the big thing. I, I, I honestly, rather than there isn't anything other like phenomenal thing that we did, we just took bulletproof 1003s. We skinnied out the file. I would say if I looked at my whole pipeline um, over the last maybe 90 days, um, of the ones that had two borrowers, we only documented one borrower's income. Um, all the self-employed people, we got ahead of all the COVID rules. Um, Another part of the process is the COVID rules really took us back to like 2005 <laughs> where, you know, I mean, it's been hard uh, documenting liquidation of all the funds. Like for the longest time, we would have a work number VOE and an IRA statement, right? You wouldn't have to show anything. And now you've got to show where's the cash coming from, make sure that it's liquid. So getting ahead of all those things so that as they go into underwriting, they're all addressed and they're all done. 
and for all the loan officers out there, just taking more ownership in that part of the process and not ever say things like my processor or let's see what the underwriter says. Like you should be smarter than the underwriter. You should be smarter than your processor. And I think the loan officers that take that accountability, their files just go in and out faster uh, because they're set up better. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but that's, that's probably the biggest thing I could say. That's perfect. So really you're getting, you're just telling the borrower ahead of time because of the COVID rules, hey, here's what I need. You're just not waiting till it gets further down the road to make sure you can get it through. Correct. Right. Second, someone says self-employed. Okay. Well, let me tell you about COVID. In the old days, we just get your last year's tax return. But now because of COVID, we have to get most recent two months bank statements, year to day P&L. We got to cross-reference the revenue to make sure, right? Like that conversation, if it happens right there, then you get all the stuff right there. You figure out if you have a problem right there instead of 45 days later when it comes out of underwriting because everybody's busy. Right. And, and time. You're not wasting time. You're figuring out front if it's going to work or not. Exactly. Yeah. And getting it so that by the time the underwriter gets it, it's, it's, it's all there. <laughs> you know, there's no conditions and there's no guessing. Like with a lot of companies and what I learned in 2009, I was at a company that uh, was notoriously known for great rates, but also like awful closing. And I came in and I started closing loans in two and a half weeks. And everyone's like, how are you closing loans in two and a half weeks when people can't get things done for two or three months? And it truly just goes down to, I knew everything that was needed. I got it all so that as the underwriter got to it, it was like, like book wrapped or whatever. Yeah, it was like gift wrapped. Is that what they say? Yeah, it was flawed. It was perfect. On. Yeah. Like I, I could almost imagine them going for my loan. Be like, Oh, I'm going to need the, Oh, there it is right there. Right. Like that's how I wanted to, to prepare the, the, the file. And I think that that is lost in today's mortgage environment. Um, when I talk to people that have struggles at, at their companies, 70% of the time it comes back to like, well, it's, I think that's your fault. I don't think it's your company's fault. <laughs> like you could do a better job. Like you could have asked this question. You could do this instead. But I think a lot of people try to look at that division of labor, right? Like I'm sales. I'm not going to disclose loans. Well, I think you should if things are busy, right? Like why not? You could pay a lot of money. So I don't know. That's just my, my philosophy of it is we could all do at the loan officer level, we could always do more. We are generally the ones making the biggest part of the commission. And it's a big commission for what we do. So sometimes be more perfect, do more of what maybe you didn't do in slower times. Uh, and I think you'd have better output. Talk about most people try to figure out, well, how do I talk for as little as I have to, but as much as I need to. So they're like, oh, you know, stopwatch. Oh, I got off the phone in seven minutes and they're going to my online app. I mean, your app is in a seven minute, your, your conversation is not seven minutes. What's, what's the average time for you yeah. and, a, and a client who calls in for the first time? Oh, I am awful. So like if anyone out there is trying to measure people on like efficiency of phone calls, like don't look at me. <laughs> the, uh, so I do track all of this though. And my um, average conversation is 45 minutes long. Um, but in that 45 minutes, it's probably, 10, 15 minutes of fact finding, 10, 15 minutes of education, 10, 15 minutes of um, connection building sprinkled throughout. Um, and I, I big believer in always giving the best advice and saying no when you should. Um, talking people out of doing things that don't make sense, right? Call right before this one. Guy really wanted to refinance his investment two unit property in DC and just spent 25 minutes talking him out of it. <laughs> And just said, just get an equity line on your owner occupied. Here's like the 5,000 reasons why you shouldn't do this. Right. But I think a lot of loan officers would be like, you, you have this desire and my job is to say, can you yes or no? And then do it. And I did that the first 10 years. And then when I lived through the financial crisis and became everyone's counselor and managed to help them through all their bad decisions, I just realized that our job is probably bigger um, than that. So all that said, I, I, uh, it's still probably 45 minutes. Uh, I talk way too, too much, as you can see. Like you ask one question and I keep rambling. That's kind of how I am. <laughs> no, that's, that makes you the perfect guest, right? And well, and you're, you're, you're adding, you know, adding more meat on the bone, right? I think that's, you know, oftentimes what I tend to find is that, that some of the, the super producers that we talk to that are doing your type of volume um, have such a unique 
way they do it that no one else can pull it off. And I think that you just come across, since I know you well, this is who you are. You're a genuine person. And I think that's why you connect with people. And my guess is even though you're spending 45 minutes, which you think is too long, my guest tells me, yeah, maybe you could shave off five or 10 minutes and still have the same result. However, I bet that overall you're spending less time on the file and the transaction than other people because of getting that perfect 1003 up front, because you're building that report up front, then, then you have to do less at the end would be my guess. Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So if I go and, and say, why do I still do those long conversations? One is I, I, I like the conversations because I like the people. Um, but what I've found is that when hey, I- it's good to like the business and like what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The, um, what I've found is that when I take more time to explain, from a purchase standpoint, people, they write contracts sooner and the contracts they write are stronger. And I think it's because they have more confidence in all the little things that go into buying a house, right? So whether it's just asking a simple question, you know, if we fast forward life five to seven years from now, like what does that life look like? And is this price point that we're talking about today, is it sustainable for that period of time? Or are we looking for something at just, just a little conversation like that, right? That might be three, four, five minutes. They go home, they talk about it more. They go to the real estate agent. They have more clarity. They, they write a stronger contract. Um, you know, and, and I, we, we do get a lot of referrals just I think because of the personal connection and the general thing out here is John will take his time and explain all this stuff. Um, I've seen a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. You know, the, uh, I have relatives that thought I just did purchase stuff. And then I've found through the grapevine that, you know, my old servicer would send them a letter and they would say, Hey, you can get $20,000 cash out and your payment drops 50 bucks a month. And then when I see the closing disclosure, they paid like a one and three quarters point. They paid like $8,000 in closing costs to get 20,000 cash out. Right. Like that's abusive in my opinion, but like, if people know that you're that person that's going to look out for them forever, they'll also come back to you for, Hey, I got this thing. Should I really be doing this? Right? Like the gentleman that wanted to do the cash out, it was a referral of someone else uh, on the investment property. So I think it's time well spent. It's, there is a segment of the business that I think you can't do that with. So when I started getting into, and maybe this would be a segue into some of the videos, but direct to consumer things, I did realize that my direct to consumer, my deep relational approach does not mesh well with the direct to consumer atmosphere. So when I start dialing that up, I do have to change to be a little bit more transactional and pointed. Um, I only use my deep relational approach with real estate agents that are giving me real referrals, not something they just got off of Zillow five minutes ago. So talk about that direct consumer piece. So what, what you're saying is that that client isn't expecting to have a relationship with you because the realtor didn't say, talk to John, he's so good at helping people. So I think it's more that when you're direct, again, this is totally my opinion. There's a whole bunch of people out here that are probably doing it way better than I've ever done it. But for me, I haven't found that they value and remember, I'm painting them with a brush, them, whoever they are, um, that they value the deep, the, the relationship and the, and the advice. You know, when I've, when I've had like a Zillow person that I spent 45 minutes to and then did a 15 minute presentation and then had a 30 minute follow up call. And then they, as I uh, follow up with them, I find out they go under contract and they never even told me. And I was like, yeah, but what about all the time that we spent? And I've had people say, well, I just thought that was your job. <laughs> and so there's part of my scripting, I'm sure that's off, but I, I, as a general practice, try not to go as deep with things that are not tied to close connections, real estate connections, developer connections. Um, I feel like I get taken advantage of in those cases because I can't necessarily change the way I behave uh, with the advice of the council. You know, it's funny when I posted that you were going to be uh, on today, you know, Emmett Dempsey and Jason Frazier both commented about uh, us spending time together at Agent 2021 a couple years back. Uh, as Emmett said, it seems like a million years ago, uh, where you were the moderator of the panel that I was on at Gary V's event for social media. And I thought it was just such a great placement for you because number one is you ask great questions. And number two is that you really do unique things with video. Um, and so ironically, I thought it was, that was the only 
uh, funny part was that you were, you were asking the questions when you should have been one of the panelists too, but uh, you were able to bring your expertise out in the conversation, which you know, put the rest of us on the panel to shame. Um, so obviously you're not doing a ton of con directing consumer marketing right now because you're so busy with refis, but I got to imagine at some point you're going to turn that back on. So what are you, what are you still doing video wise to really make sure that you're keeping relevant until you do your next big launch? Yeah. So funny you say that because it literally was last week that I started saying, okay, this isn't going to last forever. Right? So if there's one thing all of us watching this in the mortgage business can follow is like we're all doing well and we're all having record months and we all feel like we're awesome and we are all getting these larger egos as a result of all the stuff that we're doing. Uh, the other side of this is going to be awful, in my opinion. It is going to be so hard because everyone's going to start grabbing and clawing at every loan again and then margins are going to go down and everyone's going to be fighting and refis will go away, right? Like it's, it's not going to be fun. It's like 2018, right? That was not a fun year. Uh, it was grind. So, um, so then I have done a couple direct to consumer, but they're more like, uh, retard, like ads that I've done through my client database with lookalike audiences talking about refinancing and probably the best one for all the people out there is, you know, don't trust your servicing lender. You know, oftentimes they try to rip you off. Let me give you two or three examples. Why, um, that was that converted really well, right? A lot of people like, Oh, my servicer just sent me this thing. I wonder if I should do it. Um, well, let me call this guy because he said, right. So I think, um, that's like super easy to do. Some things that we're implementing right now would be, uh, trying to take all pre-approval leads that come in and then zap that over like the email address over to our Facebook ads, ads manager to then serve a series of five or six, get to know you, um, video ads from us. Uh, and sequence that out. That's the thing we're working on right now, but that's more of a, I don't know if that's direct to consumer as, as much as it is maybe um, increasing lead conversion. Um, and then I haven't, I, I, I want to get back uh, to uh, my podcast. It's amazing. I have not done but nine episodes. It's been out for two years. And every month I look at the report and I'm still getting over 700 downloads a month on those episodes. And I get LinkedIn messages all the time. I love your content. When are you going to do more? So I am probably going to get back into that. That is awesome. All right. So now we have to, now we have to unpack some of that. So we'll make sure that we get some of the links to Bill Hillestead's video. So if you want to learn about what John talked about of creating a, a you know, loading into Facebook and creating a lookalike audience, you know, just go to the mortgage coach YouTube channel and type in Bill Hillestead. And you'll see that there's at least half a dozen interviews Dave and I have done with them over the past couple of years where he talks about how to do that and gives away a lot of free resources. Uh, but ultimately, uh, go back to the type of video. So when you did the video that says, hey, don't go back to your service or they're ripping you off, is that a 30 second video, a three minute video? What, what length of video are you using for those types? Um, so I'm really wordy, so it's been really hard for me. I bought, here, I bought this thing, uh, which is a teleprompter. It was like 160 bucks. Um, so I tried to use this to make it shorter, but then I realized when I read, I'm awful. Uh, and then what else did I get? So answer your question, two, two and a half minutes. And what I'm, I, I bought a lot of video equipment. If like that wall is covered, um, because I tried, I wanted to make it nice. I wanted the lighting to be good. I wanted the message to be a little impactful and I have not figured out how to do B-roll really well yet, but I I've started, you know, where I just put the camera here and I'm typing on my computer and it's, you know, watch my figures type. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, two, two, two and a half to three minutes is about as short as I can make them. And what's the frequency that you're recording new videos? Are you just letting a video run for a week, two weeks? Uh, when, when I did that specific ad, it ran for a month with no more than, uh, um, I might be a little off on the metric, but it was no more than five views per week. Ran it for about a month. And I had two audiences. One was my past client database, and the other was the lookalike audience. And what I would say is, although I cannot tie directly past client to that video, pretty remarkable how many past clients reached out to me at a new company with my new address. Um, so I, I think it, I think it worked really well, but it was no more than five times viewed per week uh, and run, run for a month. Five times to the same consumer. Same person. 
Yeah, right, the so. frequency got up there. Um, I didn't get a lot of do not likes, right? Like I think when when people say like stop showing me this, yeah. it hurts your your um, rankings, but it it performed pretty well. That is awesome. I always love those types of ideas. All right, let's let's switch gears for a minute because you were joking about it. I'm going to brag, right? You look great. Like a lot of people I'm talking to under in COVID, we're talking ahead of time. We're like, oh my clothes are tight, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And you were like, well, yeah, my clothes are tight because I've been working out a lot. Um, so <laughs> how have you done all those loans, um, disclosed them yourself, spent 45 minutes with the clients um, and maintained uh, a workout schedule and in, in a, a, like a, a little bit of balance. I hate to use that word, but you know, that's what people tend to be giving up their self-care right now. And you seem to be crushing it from a discipline perspective. Well, so I think so COVID for me, so I'm the most extroverted introvert you'll ever meet. Um, I, I love it when you say that. It, it, well, I am, right? Like, so I got a lot of energy. I'm excited. But man, I love being at home. I, I love, so for me, I picked up about two and a half hours of commuting time going in and out of D.C. that I don't really go in and out of D.C. much anymore. Um, the, so I get to see my kids a lot, have dinner every night, um, we, but we did some neat stuff. Like we found, uh, this was like right before COVID, we found a, a, a distributor. It was like a meat distributor where you buy six months of your food and it was like super organic and whatever. And, you know, it's all out in the freezer. Uh, so we had like amazing food the whole time. Um, we all signed up with trainers, including my kids, which is pretty funny. Um, and then we have all these little fitness apps, like on my phone, I've got a, it's called train heroic and training peaks. And then we have actually a trainer that sort of uploads workouts and things like that, that we follow. And we do zoom workouts a few times a week, Megan and I with a group. So it's been fun. Like I, I what I find out about myself is that when I can keep fitness dialed in, like if I go back in my whole life, the years that I had a fitness focus everything else tended to do really well. When I start letting that go is when I also start letting a bunch of other things go. So a buddy of mine that owns a gym in town, uh, he basically said, look, during this time, like the lazy get lazier or the fit get fitter, which one do you want to be? Right. And that was like a, well, it, I, I now for the first time in my career, although I'm crazy busy, I'm crazy busy in my house. So I, I actually have the ability to carve out real time for personal time. And it became easier than, than it was in a market where like this week I've had like four appointments in DC and it's been hard sticking to the fitness stuff and it's been hard eating like it, it's because I'm in the car now two and a half, three hours a day. Um, so that, that is a change that I kind of don't like, but it's here. Well, it's interesting you say that because I've heard so many people say, and I know it's true for me, right? When I'm, when I've got focus on me, everything else comes in. I mean, I think morning routine is, is so key and that's why it's one of the things that, you know, that's uh, recorded as an activity in win by noon. And of course, mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful you're a win by noon user. So, you know, I'd be silly if I didn't, uh, if I win didn't. By uh, quarter four right yeah. here. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Um, Cause I do think that that's part of it is that, you know, you are, if you're disciplined personally, then, you can have the time to do everything else. But I also heard you say it's because you had an extra two and a half hours. So now as you transition where you may be doing more going into town and you're struggling with that, what are the things that you're going to focus on to make sure that you don't turn away from the fitness that you've created? Um, yeah, <laughs> well, uh, I'm about to start having a lot of those talks with myself right now. Um, you know, I think in the, so uh, a big goal. So I gave myself a goal, I don't know, four or five, six months ago to break a five minute mile. And that was, I remember training as a kid in high school. My coach was 43 years old. I'm 43 years old. And all summer long, we trained for him to break a five minute mile. And when he did, he was like so excited and he cried. He was like, you don't understand how hard it is for an old guy like me to do something like this that I hadn't done since high school. So that's always stuck in my head. So I kind of want to be that guy. Um, so that goal is actually keeping me disciplined to do the daily actions. Um, so I think for me, it's going to constantly have a goal. Whenever I do something for the health of it, it's not a big enough driver for me. Um, you know, quite frankly, sort of pivoting over to like one of the reasons I came to this mortgage company to Vellum is a good friend of mine named Greg Kingsbury. Like if I was really excited at a business that I did, he doubled me and he keeps doubling me every month effortlessly and has a great work-life balance. And 
has like built out a great team, right? So I'm actually here to learn from him and to be driven that competitive side of me that keeps me focused. Uh, that that's a piece. So I think to answer your fitness question, it's, it is going to be more maintaining goals that are a little hard to reach that today's action will affect this goal a month from now. And once I know that it keeps me doing the today action, kind of like your win by noon thing, right? Like what, what, what is that saying you taught me a long time ago? Like what gets tracked and measured, improved, get measured, gets done, right? We all know that. And, and you have to, if you don't know what activities you need to get to the result, my guess is you've got a training plan to get to your five minute mile. And I think that people who have a goal to do 10 loans, 15 loans, 20 loans, they don't know what it's going to take to get there. Right. So your trainer is giving you a map to get there. And I think with win by noon, what it, if people who use it for this part are using it to figure out how many activities, how many conversations, how many calls am I making in order to get to that end result of the goal? Just like, you know, how many runs you have to do in order to get to the five minute mile. Yeah. You know, to that point, um, you turned me on to a book years ago. It was, uh, or was it Justin Harris, Four Disciplines of Execution? Oh, yeah. Um, the, the, the 40X. So there are parts of your win by noon that sort of, for me, incorporate the 40X disciplines, which is measuring the, the single action that ultimately will lead to this big audacious goal that you're trying to get to. And what we learned when we ran this exercise in our branch is it started out like, oh, we need to do more loans. Well, duh, that's the goal. So how do we do more loans? Oh, we need more realtors. Okay, um, how do we do that? And we drilled it all the way down to uh, more phone calls and then more face-to-face -face interactions, like personal interaction is what we labeled it. And then we built that in our CRM. And every time someone wound up having a face-to-face -face or, or deep personal co connection, they'd score a point. And then we had dashboards and we had you know, like the scoreboard, and then that all drove the energy. And then when everyone could see the improvements, which they often didn't see for two or three months, then it became a core principle. Like they saw, wow, when I follow these daily principles, this big thing will happen. And I think that's what your win by noon book is for a lot of people. If you just stick to the principles, you do those right things consistently with pig headed disciplines and then build connection throughout you're going to have a tremendous amount of success. You know, it's so critical. It's funny because you mentioned 4DX, right? Because they call those lead indicators, the things you do up front, but they say you get distracted by, they call it the whirlwind. And it's just funny because I think that's been the mortgage business for the last six months. And it's been crazy to me how many uh, win by noon users have said, oh my gosh, I went, I went for the first month of COVID. I didn't even, didn't even open it up because they were at home and they weren't in their office. And they were like, once I started uh, using it again and recording my activities to make sure that I had those disciplines, all of a sudden my business went from chaos to organized busyness to get things done. And I think that that's always the, the challenge as we, you know, if the market does transition, like, you know, like you said, it may, then I think that's where people are going to have to get laser focused on it. You know, now I think a lot of people, since loans are still are falling in their laps, aren't, I don't need to worry about that. I can figure it out. But I definitely know that taking the time to figure out what for you as your lead indicator to get to a closed loan is going to be really critical as we get back to a 2018 type market. At some point in the future, we will. I agree. Yeah. You know, I've um, been talking to a few younger mortgage loan officers that started just about two years ago and they're not doing a lot of refinances, but they're having like rock star years. And it kind of through conversation, we started going back and talking about all the people that I knew that started in the business with no experience that are now doing a tremendous amount of business. And the common theme on a lot of people is they started right around a big, massive refi year. And what happens in big, massive refi years? All the experienced people sit in, they dial for dollars and they just crank this way. Agents still like them until agents like, wow, that's slow. New guys there like, what about me? What about me? Right. And then boom, that guy gets in does a good job. Next thing you know, gets pole position. Other agents in that office start saying you should use that guy. He's available. And then a year later, the experienced loan officer is like, whoa, what happened? I'm, I'm here. <laughs> so lesson in that is for anyone out there that's really trying to get aggressive to build their career, not just to make a lot of money in this market, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Like cold calling, probably is going to work greater right now than ever. Like we talked yesterday about to a gentleman filling out a, like making like a rock star presentation. And I don't know what that presentation is. I'm actually, it's 
one of my action items, start thinking about one. But whatever that hook is, that becomes the cold call. Hi, I'm so-and-so from such and such company. I know a lot of lenders out there just like doing the easy business. We want to talk about boom, whatever this thing is, so that you can actually start growing your business as we get into this next leg, especially if rates might rise in the future, da, 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 da. right? Like that connection, it, it can happen. Like the old school ways of just flying by real estate offices is not there. So maybe it is more Zoomy style things. I know a lot of people did Zoom back when it was cool and not annoying. Um, but now I think it's, it's back to becoming a little bit more of a, of a relevant hook if you have a good presentation and not just like a, hey, let's ch chat and get to know each other. You know, it's, it's so true. And what's interesting about it is, is that a new real, a new loan officer doesn't know any different, right? They, they're hustling. And I've been talking to a lot of folks who are trying to think, okay, my refinances have slowed down. I, I want to be ready for purchases in 2021. You know, they're still doing a fair amount of purchases and I got to go after new real estate agents. And the number one thing that I've had them all discover is they actually know enough real estate agents to hit their numbers. The one who've taken the time, the ones who've taken the time and actually uh, use the, the formulas of win by noon or whatever they're going to use to calculate it, realize that yes, they need more real estate agents, but they already know them. They're just not sending them business because they're not communicating with them. And I, I talked to a loan officer yesterday and she said, yes, this week she's talked to, she called 14 agents, 12 of them she got on the phone and 10 of them, she's basically re-sparked a commitment to do business with her because she just picked up the phone. And it started off with thinking, you know, well, where are we going to go out and get, you know, new agents? And I don't think most people need to get new agents, but you're totally right that uh, loan officers now are giving up. I mean, they just haven't done their, their normal proactive, you know, stay in touch. And I see that I've been training my brother-in-law now for a year and a half. And I was talking to him yesterday and, you know, he's just super excited because he's a hundred percent purchase, you know, and he's done some refis of some of his clients from last year, but last year he was just doing, you know, two, three, four loans a month. And, you know, now he's got, you know, way more than that going from a purchase perspective, just for that same reason, because people are picking up the phone. He's calling the listing agents, the biggest listing agents in town who historically would have never answered their phone are actually picking up their phone and he's building rapport with them. And, you know, who knows, could be some really big referral sources down the road. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I even thought of some other things that, you know, if branches out there are looking to grow and you have new people in your branch, um, like I, I, I instituted something back, you know, it's probably three years ago. It's called No Listing Agent Left Behind. And what I found is that a lot of the big producers or a lot of people, they were just too busy in the whirlwind, like you'd call it. And they'd never really put the listing agent strategy in place. But we all agree, at least I agree, that sometimes the easiest place to get a new agent is on the listing side because you have four, five, six great calls. Um, so we would just take some of the newer loan officers and then plug them into our CRM as like the communicator of the transaction. Um, and just so for ideas out there for people that are trying to grow, maybe not themselves, their team, their branch, other loan officers, that could be a neat strategy to employ right now if you're comfortable with your purchase business as it is. Well, it's funny you say that because I remember when you did that and it, it's, it's something that we all know we should do, right? We hear people talk about doing and people fail to execute on it, right? They're just busy doing the other things. So I, I love the idea of deploying another team member to do it. However, I think a lot of you should think about doing it oh, yourselves, right? I think that that's, you know, look, uh, take that look deep inside of some of these things, because again, it's not here to shame anyone who's doing refinances because make the money, right? It's, it's here, but as John said, it's not going to be here forever. And, and how are you going to come past this into what's next? And maybe what's next is still really good, but certainly, you know, in Arizona where my team operates, the market is tight, um, super busy though. I mean, they're cranking out the purchases, but they are uh, absolutely, you know, going to be uh, impacted if the market shifts. Yeah, no, uh, you know, same thing. I, I am curious, just this will be more of a, if anyone's still listening right now at 49 minutes in, put some chat things in. I am pretty curious. I have not found a slow housing market of all my friends all around the country. Everyone's cranking on the purchase side. Um, I'm just curious where the COVID pain is because in DC, we're not feeling it. We're not hearing it. We're not seeing it. We're not like it, it, it just feels like the whole world has figured out how to deal with the new way of living and they're just spending differently and then spending on larger ticket items. So although rates maybe go up in the future, it still just might be an amazing housing run, uh, you know, for the next two, three, four years. 
Yeah, it's um, they're definitely predicting at least in this market here because it's the one that I pay attention to for my team. They're they're predicting in another uh, that year over year uh, within six months it could be twenty percent total appreciation. You know, and it's nine wow. percent, eight or nine percent right now for Case Shiller. So, um, so that's John's ask for you, those of you, because I know there's a bunch of you in Zoom. Go ahead and click in the chat what your market is and whether uh, you are seeing purchase business up or down because he wants to know who. If you're in that market that is flat because of COVID, we'd love to hear it because that would be interesting interesting information. So um, take a moment. You're all here. Get in the chat. If you're in Facebook, I can't see Facebook, but put it in there as well. Robert's uh, watching that for us. So I think, um, again, little tidbits like what you just said, no agent left behind. That's what I know is the amazing part of John Downs and, and why we term this kicking ass with, with John Downs. So now as you're thinking through this, you said, hey, I got to relaunch my podcast. What else is it that you think um, as you're as you're reflecting, is that that are things that you might in, implement besides that, or is that just it going forward the next let's call it the next ninety days? No, so um, I want to very I want to put a button on because I have the framework completed for um, a really good lead nurture strategy that is not spammy and canned like most CRMs that are out there. Um, a tip for if people want to try to do this is I took, I just went through a closed pipeline and I again, have deep conversation with a lot of people so I can remember all the questions that they asked me. And then I wrote down a list of all the questions that they maybe wanted to ask me. Um, and then you can start creating content to answer a lot of those questions proactively. Cause I think, I think good marketing is answering questions when the person has it, but they haven't asked it yet. Right? Like, um, and then serving that content at that right time. So I think, um, so I, I've been talking about this for three years, Todd. So <laughs> it'll be finally putting a button on that. Uh, I do want to, uh, I want to have a, a real YouTube channel that is educational with a purpose, like a do-over. So before it was like, oh, I need to talk about PMI. Hey, let me tell you about the three types of PMI, right? Like that stuff. Um, I think that can be done better. Um, and then I think those videos could be used in your, your lead nurture strategy. So, so that's probably if I had to bucket the things that I was going to work on specifically, it would be um, a, a, a con being consistent with the podcast, um, create a more purposeful lead nurture strategy, and, um, and then let the world know that Abby oh, is the cutest golden doodle. <laughs> It's uh, it's funny because we've had that before the call started the last few weeks as people's dogs, including uh, including Dave's. Uh, that is awesome. So yeah. we're hearing on, we're hearing on some markets. Uh, we're hearing on uh, Dallas is good. We hear that uh, Sacramento market. The only struggle is the BOE before funding. Yeah, that's a problem. I think everywhere uh, Greenville, Greenwood, South Carolina is great. And a guy named Rob Downs says that Atlanta market is is uh, strong. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, really, what's interesting is, at least for me, I, I try thinking like, okay, really, the advice that we're giving, right? Like, is there a bubble brewing somewhere? There's a part of me that thinks the mountain house, right? So in TC, it's like all these people that don't even like to hike are like, I'm going to buy a house in the mountains and I'll Airbnb it when I'm not using it. So I, I do see a lot of that, a lot of second home stuff. Um, but we're not, we're not seeing the economic pain and maybe that's just because of what happened and the safety nets in place and the people that have kept their remote jobs and their ability to work from home like we are those are higher income people that are actually able to buy a house um, so i'm more curious about the uh, if you think about it if people could enter into a forbearance and they don't have to make a payment for a year we might not know if there are shadow defaults for another 15 months right? Because then the payments have to become due and then people have to fall behind. So I'm curious to see if anyone in any market is hearing those types of undercurrents that are not being reported. Yeah, I definitely think we'll see a lot of that. I mean, I've been watching the forbearance statistics and, you know, the interesting one is the survey that was early on that said 70% of people in forbearance could afford to make their payments, which I think a lot of people are seeing on their refinances when you get a client who's got a job, never lost their job or you know, maybe thought for a week, maybe they were nervous about it, but went into forbearance. Now they're bringing them current. So I do think that'll be really interesting and we'll have to have some economists in the future, you know, come in and, and uh, educate us on this uh, channel about it. Or if any of you are experts on it or have data, you know, please, uh, please share. Um, 
But I think in the end, you know, we joked about it because you and I talked a couple weeks ago where you said people are overpaying bidding wars for their, their mountain homes. I, I hadn't thought about that market. It will be interesting to see how those all play out. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I often wonder, like, if, if we, if instantly there's a vaccine, right? How, do, do, we, do we all go back to the way we were living? Or do we all take the things that we now cherish and that our companies now allow, whether it be remote working and flexibilities and things like that. And, and you asked earlier, like, well, hey, what are you going to do to keep like the fitness thing moving forward? Because now your world is opening up. Well, that's sort of the same question of like everything else that everybody's doing, right? If everyone's fleeing to the burbs or they all of a sudden gonna be like, I hate the burbs. I want to go back to the city <laughs> or, you know, the mountain house that they never go to and now it's underwater and they can't sell and no one wants to Airbnb it. So I, I don't, you know, it, it'll be curious just. I'm always a big forecaster of life. Like if you do this thing today, is it something you're really going to enjoy and it fits into a plan or did that idea just came up, come up last week and you think you're going to capitalize on a pandemic and get rich, even though you're never going to go hike uh, and use the house. <laughs> yeah, it'll be, it'll be uh, super uh, interesting to see how that all, that all plays out. So, um, all right, we got five minutes left. Uh, we've been so uh, fortunate to have you as part of the call and I'm super excited that you'll be part of the Modern Mortgage Summit. I know that uh, you're going to add a ton of value there. Uh, any last minute topic you were hoping that, you know, I know we came into this kind of flying by the seat of our pants, which is uh, one of the things I know you're great at. Uh, what, uh, what would we, what, what last tidbit for five minutes you want to talk about? I'll put you back in the interview. Oh, geez. So, so nothing specific in the sense of, like, it's funny, nothing's really changed in 20 years as far as how we all do business. And yet we all talk about how to try and go out there and drum up new business. <laughs> and, you know, things just, they're, they're like changing ever so slightly. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little curious to see how many, and this is something we can't answer right here, but I'd love to know how many like new loan officers came into the business. Um, not just at the refi shops, but at the real shops, like how many people are growing, growing their team? How many people think that the future of mortgage is more power team, right? Think of like real estate, they do it all the time, right? They, they want one person figurehead or a group, and then they share resources to all do more business and have a common brand within a firm. Um, so I know for me, like when I look at Greg Kingsbury, he's kind of the, the, the one that I look up to in the mortgage business. He's a guy that about four years ago was just working a bazillion hours a week, closing almost 200 million a year. And he had a team, they weren't dysfunctional, but you know, like me trying to figure out how to use everybody the best way. And now here he is, he'll close 350, 400 million. He's working hard, but he's not killing himself. The team's working hard, they're not killing themselves. And it's not a massive team. I think he's got six people total, including him. So for me, I, I think focusing a little on a little less greed of money per loan, um, a little bit more of that money spread out to build out the team so that we can all have a, a, a lot of business that's sustainable, right? Because when you, when you do a lot of business, the down market doesn't hurt you. You survive the down market, right? The person that does five loans in a hot market goes to zero. The person that does 15 loans might go to seven, but they can get to the other side. Um, so that, that's it's probably my biggest thing right now is capitalize on this profitable year to then build out something more sustainable for the years to come. Learn a lot from Greg and try figuring out how he actually got all those pieces together, how he gets his, he sends me every night, he's, his little inbox zero thing drives me crazy. So that could be another thing, <laughs> how, to, how to actually read getting things done and actually do it uh, in my email. Well, I think uh, we all have to have someone to look up to in this business. Uh, John, you're one of those people that I look up to because I love uh, who you are as a person. I love what you do as an originator and I love uh, how you are as a, a family man, a, a social media guy and the fact that you're willing to share. So uh, I, love, uh, I love how you close that up. I think that's perfect, right? I think everyone here should be looking at how do you springboard um, hear from this in order to have a sustainable business going forward. I hope that's what you get on this YouTube channel uh, or on this Mortgage Coach uh, Productivity Mastermind group and on, on the Mortgage Coach YouTube channel. I look forward to seeing you on our 
Modern Mortgage Summit. I want to thank everyone for being here today. You guys are, whether you're watching it live or on video, are rock stars. Um, we all learn from the rock star, none other than John Downs. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Robert, behind the scenes for running the show. On behalf of Dave and the whole Mortgage Pro Coach crew and uh, myself and the Win by Noon crew, uh, thanks for being here. We will see you next week. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. All right. Talk to you soon.